everyone. Let us welcome Dr. Ashwin Deswanathan, Professor in Neurosurgery at Baylor's College of Medicine. He is the, the Director of Functional Neurosurgery. Dr. Ashwin's clinical practice focuses on deep brain uh, stimulation, trigeminal uh, neuralgia, cancer pain, and chronic pain. Today, we are going to discuss uh, neuroablative techniques for cancer pain management. Welcome, doctor. We are glad to have you with us today. Thank you so much for the invitation. I appreciate it. Uh, doctor, we know that cancer pain is uh, common and challenging uh, to manage, and sometimes uh, it can be controlled uh, only uh, with medications. So uh, can you tell us what is, uh, what is exactly the neuroablative technique for cancer pain management? Sure. So as you shared, uh, cancer pain is a significant problem. Uh, many patients that come, even in very specialized centers, will have continued pain, uh, even despite optimal treatment with pain medication and opioids. So a neuroablative technique is a way to interrupt how pain is transmitted in the body. So pain will go from a nerve, it will then travel to the spinal cord and up to the brain. And there are ways that we can interrupt how these signals are being transmitted through the body. And that is what neuroablative techniques are. Mm -hmm. So uh, we know uh, that the use of medications is more common in treating uh, uh, cancer pain. But when you decide to use the other method, I mean the neuroablative uh, method, and is it, is it uh, and can everyone benefit from uh, this method? method? Great question. So, you know, there were interesting studies done uh, here at Baylor and at MD Anderson looking at how soon a patient should respond uh, to pain medications. And what we have found is that if a patient doesn't respond by their third visit to their oncologist or to their supportive care or pain team, the yeah. probability of them succeeding in the longer term with pain medications is probably pretty low. Mm -hmm. um, so that's usually about the time that we'll start to think if there are alternate strategies that can be used. Um, and there are two principal ways that we can treat cancer pain interventionally. One is to implant a device to, uh, to, to administer pain medications to the spine. Mm -hmm. The other way is to lesion the nervous system. Uh, and to answer your second question, uh, uh, is it all patients that can benefit from these? There's usually some intervention that could benefit a patient. It's not everybody that, that'll benefit from, uh, from the neuroablative techniques, but between intrathecal therapy, where we implant a pump and the neuroablative techniques, there usually is some option that we can offer to improve quality of life and reduce um, the suffering associated with cancer pain. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you want to compare between the two methods, the traditional method and the new technique, uh, what, are the, what are the benefits? I mean, can you, uh, can you tell us the benefits? Yes, uh, so um, number one, the goal is to improve uh, quality of life. So, um, you know, these aren't necessarily uh, new techniques that are being developed, but what has changed over the last five to 10 years is our ability to do them in a much safer and a much less invasive way. Um, so a technique like a chordotomy, which is a way to lesion the spinothalamic tract in the neck, um, is not necessarily a new technique, but there were very nice studies that were published uh, first in uh, Turkey and also in Egypt uh, to look at the use of intraoperative imaging, specifically doing CAT scans during the procedure to watch how where the needle is located, are we in the correct position, and, um, you know, now we have done uh, some studies here in America at Baylor College of Medicine, MD Anderson, other places to study. Uh, and we know they're very safe. Um, and this is really the, the advancement of being able to perform these things in a very safe way to help patients. So the advantage is to reduce suffering, reduce dependence on medications and uh, improve quality of life. And uh, is it done in the hospital or should, should the patient go uh, always to the hospital or it can be done at home? Uh, it cannot be done at home, unfortunately. Uh, you know, there are, you know, some uh, other aspects of, you know, comprehensive supportive care that can be done at home. Uh, but these procedures, because they do require some equipment, mm -hmm. are generally either done in the radiology department or interventional radiology department, or they can be done in an operating room that's equipped uh, with a uh, intraoperative CT. There's another technique called cone beam fluoroscopy, which can also be used. That's very accessible in many hospitals. Uh, mm -hmm. That's also very good at visualizing the spine and the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. that can so, be used. Uh, and what are the side effects? We know that the, the surgeon's skills uh, is very important in, to you in using these met, met, methods. 
mean, what are the training that should uh, that should uh, that a surgeon should do before uh, trying these techniques? You know, I think the biggest thing is to have. Uh, um, you know, a good knowledge of the anatomy. Uh, there's a good community of uh, physicians uh, worldwide that are interested in cancer pain management and are very interested to help. Uh, there are a lot of online resources to learn about them. Um, but I think uh, number one is just making sure that you have the proper equipment to do it. Uh, and then number two, um, it's just really trying to be very precise and safe about where we place the electrode within the spinal cord. The procedure is done uh, to some extent with the patient uh, being awake for a short duration. Now, patients with cancer pain are obviously suffering, so sometimes it's hard to sit still for an hour. So generally having an anesthesiologist in the room is a helpful technique, though not absolutely essential. And we talk to the patient during the procedure, and we can uh, stimulate the electrode that makes the lesion to understand that we are in the proper part of the spinal cord and not in the part of the spinal cord that would cause weakness or other complications. And then we can make the lesion, uh, which is not painful to do. And usually, uh, are these uh, techniques are used in the end stage of uh, cancer, or um, in you which know, I think, stage? Uh, I think it is changing. You know, uh, I think uh, you know earlier on it was used uh, in patients with a fairly uh, limited life expectancy, meaning mm -hmm. one month, three months, but. You know, I think that is, uh, though it's beneficial at that time, it probably really doesn't capture the full benefit of, of being able to offer these techniques. So, you know, I think, um, you know, the time to consider it is in somebody where um, they have tried comprehensive medical management, they've tried opioids, um, they've tried some other less invasive techniques, and they have not received success. So, um, you know, I think doing it too late is probably not doing justice to the patient. Mm -hmm. Okay, so doctor, do we know for sure uh, that these approaches may lead to a higher rate of uh, pain relief? Uh, oh, especially, uh, we know that we are avoiding uh, the side effects of medications, yeah. you know, traditional medications. That is a great question. You know, and uh, you know, today I think uh, you know there was an interesting article on um, you know heart stenting in terms of preventing heart failure recently and showing that they don't benefit. You know, I think having good evidence is very important in medicine today. So, you know, there have been a few studies that have been undertaken. You know, probably five years ago, we did a study where patients were randomized either to continued medical management, so they would continue getting full opioid therapy, or they would be randomized to undergo the chordotomy. And uh, patients that underwent the chordotomy really did much better. Um, they would have significant reductions in pain that was durable uh, for the rest of their life. Um, and the patients had an opportunity to cross over. So if they underwent comprehensive, if they were randomized to medical management, uh, their pain continued and they were suffering, they could cross over and do the chordotomy. And those patients, a uh, number of the patients in that group crossed over and those patients also did well. So with that, we are doing another study, a more formal study to uh, randomize patients to either chordotomy or a uh, control intervention, which is an injection of morphine to really develop uh, the highest quality evidence, level one evidence that this procedure is valuable. So yes, I think there's good evidence today to support the use of chordotomy, uh, but there will be even higher quality medical evidence over the next few years. Mm -hmm. uh, are there uh, many uh, medical facili facilities uh, that are using these uh, methods or it's limited, uh, it's still limited with the... Specific... It is still somewhat limited. You know, I can speak most knowledgeably about America yeah. Uh, you know, there are a few centers in America with neurosurgeons that have the interest in doing this. Well, uh, in England, interestingly, there are some anesthesiologists that have this experience. And then, you know, the two countries that I know that have uh, that, uh, you know, Turkey is one that really uh, uh, pioneered this and um, as well as Egypt. So there are yeah. different centers that can do it. So, uh, doctor, how, how do you cooperate with the oncologists uh, to implement these uh, methods uh, and techniques? The this is the uh, most important part, you know, yeah. I think uh, good relationships with the oncologist, you know, every cancer center is a little bit different in terms of who primarily manages pain. Sometimes it's the oncologists. Sometimes they will also in, uh, engage the support of palliative care physicians or pain physicians. So I think having this group of, you know, multidisciplinary and multi-specialties that can provide input really leads to the best care. 
So, you know, either the oncologist or the supportive care physicians can really help us understand if the, med if the patient is medically optimized um, in terms of trying opioids. And when, that, uh, when it seems like we have not uh, uh, achieved great progress there, that's the right time. But it really is a very collaborative endeavor. Mm -hmm. And doctor, uh, what are the other procedures uh, you, you are applying in, uh, at Baylor St. Luke Medical Center? I mean, in the neuroablative. Uh... Yes. Uh, so, you know, for patients that have uh, cancers that involve the abdomen or the belly, yeah. um, this is a little bit different type of pain than if somebody has a tumor in the, the, the leg that's causing pain. Mm -hmm. this, is this is transferred in the spinal cord in a different way. So this pain is called visceral pain. Uh, for visceral pain, we can do a very similar procedure, but it targets a different pain pathway in the spinal cord. Uh, there's a We talked about the spinal thalamic tract is a target for chordotomy, which carries pain from different parts of the body. Uh, the dorsal column's visceral pain pathway is another pain pathway in the spinal cord that runs in the midline. So that can be uh, lesioned as well for patients that have, for example, pancreatic cancer, or gynecological malignancies or, or colorectal tumors that are causing visceral pain. So that would be one other technique that can be used for, um, uh, for cancer-related pain. So doctor, do you think we will reach uh, a, a point where there is no pain, cancer, the cancer patients won't, won't feel any pain? You know, I don't know if uh, we're there today. Uh, you know, the hope is that as we learn more about <coughs> how we can use these interventions, you know, as we are doing for chordotomy, getting good quality medical evidence, that same process needs to be done for the various techniques that we can do. There's very good evidence for intrathecal pumps, which I mentioned to you. Um, and we believe these other techniques work and are safe. Um, but I think the question is, you know, really presenting to the oncologists and the supportive care physicians good evidence about them. And uh, this is going to help the dissemination and reduce the suffering associated with cancer pain. This is one area where we have a lot of opportunity because, yeah. um, you know, I think today, if you look at the data, you know, probably 60 or 70 percent of cancer patients will have tremendous pain. So really making a, a significant effort, as we have done in terms of curing cancer or treating the cancer itself, with that same parallel movement needs to be done in terms of treating the symptoms and the suffering with cancer. Great. Uh... So, uh, doctor, one last question. When, when do you speak with your patients about these uh, methods? So uh, do, the, do, do they have a say in this? They have to choose. Do you, do you give them the choices? Absolutely. You know, so, you know, they usually have much uh, closer relationships with their oncologist. Yeah. So when, we, when uh, the oncologist or the supportive care physician asks us to meet the patient, we talk very honestly about the different opportunities. Uh, we talk about intrathecal pumps. We talk about continuing on medications. We talk about ablative techniques as well. And we weigh the pros and cons of each of these. And uh, patients um, you know, really are key members of the decision-making process. And uh, it's a cooperative decision among the, the, the three or more parties on what to do. Great. Thank you, doctor. Would you like to add anything uh, about the subject? No, I think uh, you covered a lot of the, the important topics. And I think, you know, the biggest message that I would share to uh, physicians and to patients, perhaps more importantly, is that if they're suffering, especially in the setting of cancer pain, there's usually some other alternative strategy that could be used to improve the pain. So you know, I think it's just a question of uh, reaching out to the right physicians and, uh, and exploring the opportunities. But no, it was a great discussion. I appreciate all the questions. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it was a wonderful time. Thank you, doctor. Thank you very much.